Part 5, Chapter 22, we are in modern to postmodern. So we're going to look at the New York School, uh, assemblage and happenings, art of the 60s and 70s. We get into conceptualism and land art and feminism and photorealism. Uh, art since the 80s, postmodernism. Postmodernism happens back in here a little bit, but um, as well, it get, takes hold in the 80s. Let's put it that way. These are our uh, key terms, abstract, abstract expressionism. <clears throat> that becomes the big one uh, for quite a number of years, and almost everybody is doing this and nothing nothing but, okay? Drip and action painting, kind of the same thing, but drip technique is a form of action painting. Color field is an abstract expressionist type of painting. All three are abstract expressions. Excuse me, I'm having the hiccups. <clears throat> Neo-Dadaism, now our father of Dada, who is uh, Marcel Duchamp, he's still around so he gets to see this, so it's kind of nice for him because he gets very frustrated in the art world and he sees himself vindicated in the end. Hard edge painting, pluralism, appropriation, who um, Duchamp also starts, he's the father of that as well, and Neo-Expressionism. The, f the, fault, the um, how you want to say, the fruition of the late 60s and 70s is really to do with a lot of the seeds that Duchamp sows a hundred years ago in, in the teens, in 1918 and so on. Okay, so from World War II, we're getting a ton, a big influx of people, exiled European artists, not, not just artists, but we're getting scientists, we're getting um, all kinds of thinkers and philosophy, we're getting psychology, we're getting um, mathematicians, you name it. Now, a lot of these people were people who would have been persecuted by the Nazis, but also some of them that were smart enough to figure out what was happening soon enough to get out, um, they were approached by Hitler to uh, support his cause, and they realized they needed to get out. Otherwise, he would get a hold of their secrets. Um, Alfred Hitchcock was actually one of these people who left um, uh, Germany, and Hitler actually... Um, wrote a letter to him and approached him to become um, head of propaganda and filmmaking for him. <clears throat> and he declined and he said something to the effect of, um, I don't think that Germany needs another murderer. So he's very famous for saying that to Hitler. Um, and so he moves to England for a while and then he comes to the U.S. as a filmmaker. But uh, so just the context of all this immigration of, of, Really, just some brilliant people, some regular folks too, but not everybody has the means to get out. Uh, but some of these scientists and so on, we get them out and um, benefit from their expertise and win the war. But we also get a lot of artists, and previous to this, as we remember, the Academy in Paris, <clears throat> the London Academy and the Paris Academy, they rule the roost. Paris is the center of the art world for a long, long time, and now it's New York City because everybody's left Europe. Okay, so also we have the founding of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 1929. It's still there. It's almost 100 years old now, but it's the first Western art museum, first muse art museum period to uh, be dedicated to modern art. So we're thinking at this point in 29, we're thinking Picasso, we're thinking perhaps Duchamp, although I don't know exactly who was showing there at that time. But early things um, that are being shown there from the early 20th century, late 19th century, possibly Impressionism, which you don't really see there now, but um, actually that's not true. There are some there. Matisse. Matisse is big in the modern. MoMA, as it's called. We use the Museum of Modern Art now a lot. They're big on their educational programming, and the videos are really great if you ever want to look at their YouTube site or on their regular website on MoMA. So the New York School gets founded. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the painters, um, this is the first post-war art movement, and this is the first art movement really associated with the U.S. Uh, in terms of painting. And this is uh, Paul Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, and Rothko. Rothko and de Kooning are from Europe, okay? So de Kooning is Dutch, and Rothko is German. Pollock, I don't know, I think he was born in the U.S., but he's from immigrant parents. Um, but they are 
um, a loosely aligned group of people. The work looks very, very different, but we get into abstract expressionism, and it's somewhat influenced by surrealism, not, not in a way that you could look at it and see it. But the idea is that paintings uh, were very, very large, and you were meant to interact with it in a um, mm, purified way. Like you bring your being and your soul and yourself fully to this work, and the work is going to communicate with you with no imagery whatsoever. 1949, we have number one, Jackson Pollock's drip painting here. Um, so he's taking, this is metallic paint, but he's taking multiple kinds of paints and just figuring out what drips best. And this is um, enamel. Now, enamel is normally normally a spray paint. Men enamel and metallic paint are um, <clears throat> uh, associated with automotive paints. If you've ever used enamel paint, accidentally bought it, um, and it take forever, it would take forever to dry, you will you will suffer the consequences for that. Very stinky, very toxic. He didn't live long enough to get cancer, though. So that's that's a different story. So he's got all these swirls, and you think about this layering and layering and layering and layering and layering. Massive painting, uh, almost nine feet across here, and what are we, five feet high here. So, um, and remember, your first number is always your height, second one is width. It's always, always, always. Uh, different colors and then he's letting it dry he's walking around in his studio and you see an image of him doing this and I don't know where it is in the book I've lost track of where that image is but he's walking around and he's flinging paint around and he's capturing his movement so that's where the action painting comes the action in action painting is that it's capturing the paint dripping off the brush now he's not sleepwalking I won't say that but he's in a more meditative-ish state. He's trying to really just express himself, hence the expressionism and abstract expressionism. Um, he's flinging things out and trying to just get in touch with himself and just uh, do sort of automatic painting, meaning just react and react in these patterns uh, to show what he's ex feeling. And you get a sense of chaos. You get a sense of wildness. Um, you get a sense of dance is another word that some people use. Um, so he doesn't want to show himself in the painting in the sense that he's represented, represented, there's no figures, but he's showing uh, his gestures and his movements. We're capturing them here, if that makes sense. So it's an unstretched canvas on the floor. So he would have a studio floor or garage floor and just put, you know, like a canvas is really just fabric. Put it that way and you just leave it on the floor and then he would just drip onto it. And he'd have a controlled gesture. He'd kind of imitate the same movement a little bit, but then kind of play on that a little. Kind of similar how jazz has improvisation, if that makes sense. So no images, um, but it's capturing the uh, painter's dance or movement, if you like. Uh, and then color field we get into is a different way to approach things. So broad areas of color. Rothko, oh, yummy. One of my all-time favorites. Try making the, one of these paintings. Just I want to assign that at some point. It looks simple, doesn't it? Well, it's not. <laughs> This has such depth into it and uh, color and like all these uh, connections here, very subtle and it's really hard to not get a hard edge on, on these, um, these soft edges. So this would be the opposite of hard edge. It's quite soft, big areas of color. Some color field painters, and I don't think this is true of Rothko, but others do this. Helen Frankenthaler does this, where she waters down the paint. She thins it with turpentine, or not turpentine, with other oil. Maybe a little turpentine, but I don't think so. Um, she thins it out, and then she lays the canvas on a tabletop, and then she puts some paint. She, she tilts the canvas, and then it soaks through and in different spaces. Rothko is not doing that. But it kind of gives you the sense of how color field painting happens, where he's he's still using brush strokes here, but his he's wanting his brush strokes to uh, disappear, if that makes sense. 
He's just trying to get some soft edge. Uh, in the book, I'm going to read from here, page 503. Soft edge, horizontal fields of color on a vertical color ground. So our ground would be this lighter, paler orange that's been mixed with a little bit of white, perhaps. And then we have a darker orange here that's more pure color and a yellow up here. So um, let's see. Where de Kooning emphasized the physicality of paint, and so did Pollock. So de Kooning, Pollock, and Rothko are three of the biggest ones, biggest names in abstract expressionism. Boys Club, very macho. Um, Rothko does the opposite here, thinning his color so much that the pigment powder barely holds to the canvas. So he has a meditative quality to these, and um, they're very, very... Uh, how do you want to say it? It's like it seems like there's a depth of field there. There, there isn't, of course. There's just you know color, but they do feel uh, like the field sort of encompasses you, and that's kind of true of Barnett Newman as well, another abstract expressionist painter. But you kind of get soaked in there, and and your mind goes deeper into this uh, this space. Very large, you know, 91 inches high, um, and he would often put multiples in a room. There was a cathedral he did in, I want to say it was in Dallas, I'm pretty sure that's right, and they were all muted grays and darker colors, and it was very depressing, but it was um, the end of his life. He commits suicide also. Um, Roth, or sorry, um, I'm backtracking, sorry. Pollock gets into a car wreck while drunk driving.